amount of control, are we close or not? Remember, I always couple implementation in my mind with the theory work necessary to get there. I was not divorcing those in that. And the money we spent to make sure that the products cannot be penetrated is very aggressive in the nuclear command and control arena and the holes we dig and the missiles we shield and the rest of it. I don't think the commercial sector plays. I think we've got toys that you don't yet there. And Adi, you have to... Uh, actually... I think uh, I want to sidetrack this further. But, you know, <laughs> I'm getting too friendly. <laughs> I have no idea what the NSA is doing, but I have one data point which looks very curious. Uh, a few years ago, uh, the NSA declassified, in response to Freedom of Information uh, request, uh, the titles of all the uh, papers published in their internal technical journal, top secret technical journal. Uh, the papers themselves were not published, only the titles. I read very carefully the uh, hundreds of titles, and this was all the way up to 1983. And this, I'd like to remind everyone, this was about six or seven years after the invention of public cryptography. I didn't see a single paper published in the internal technical journal of the NSA, which even mentioned public cryptography in its title. So isn't it uh, a demonstration that the NSA was way behind in public cryptography, at least at that time? Well, people who invent things in parallel don't necessarily use the same terminology. No, I, they might not have I could read behind the lines. PKI. Okay. Um, this, I, is, this is a dance. I've danced before. I'm tired of it. I, okay, but I actually know the answer to that question, but a bit better than this. The NSA Technical Journal is a very funny object. Its name suggests that it's like the Bell System Technical Journal, but it isn't at all, because the Bell System Journal was created as part of something called the Kingsbury Agreement that required, as an anti-monopoly measure, the Bell System to tell people what it was doing. That is not the, all the intention of the NSA Technical Journal. It is purely a device for internal motivation. The real literature at NSA is departmental reports. And the technical journal and its successor, the Cryptologic Quarterly, were all things for punching your, you know, like forgetting tenure. It's good for your promotion to publish things in the technical journal. I do not believe, here, here what I'm confident of, you know, I can't, the next I can't be, I do not think it accurately represents the importance of work in the agency. There are two papers on public key uh, later, in the late 80s, in the, in the Cryptologic Quarterly. Uh, one about outside world and one about some key management issues yeah. that turn on. Well, we took it in studies, and again, uh, in, in the agency, the tech uh, journal didn't cover all the literature uniformly because we have compartmented areas internally. Well, the, but and the surprising issue. thing is that on balance, uh, ComSec is less sensitive than SIGINT. So the rather scarce number of papers on you know, a variety of sorts of systems you don't find represented there. That was, to me, surprising, because I thought those groups would have published more internally. We're probably at exponential decay. Give us another question. <laughs> well, we have uh, just enough time at this point for some closing statements. Any thoughts on the discussion today? Any notable omissions in, in your view? Whit, would you like to start? Now, I cede the balance of my time. I'll have outbursts as time goes on and interrupt others. <laughs> this is the wrap-up round then, last go-round? Yeah. Okay. So, uh, well, the only thing I would add, and maybe someone will comment on it, in, t in terms of your, your last question about NSA and the, acad and the open literature, uh, uh, it seemed to me uh, that the advances in uh, breaking hash functions came heavily from the open community, even though there had been review by NSA. So how does that figure into it? I'll pass, let's see if someone has time to answer that. I mean, the, the work that Jerry and Wang did certainly... Uh, I mean, it seems to me, in fact, that, evidence yeah. that that's an area yes. in which the two communities are not miles apart. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Sticking with that theme of what are the differences between the two communities, I mean, one area where the NSA uh, certainly is, is, is orders of magnitude different is building systems. I mean, the academic community, I mean, we, we get a group of researchers together to factor RSA's 768, the amount of resources that they use on that is, is large by academic standards, but piddling by compared to what NSA can mount on this, and building, architecting large systems to, uh, to attack a, a crypto analytic problem, getting large data sets together, large number of machines coordinated to attack a problem is, is something the academic community just cannot uh, address at all, uh, except in theory, which, which you really need to get your hands dirty with a lot of these problems to, to do it so. Um, 
Other final statements, I, you asked generically for things. I think the, the importance of platform security is, is with us. I think I've said that before at many of these things. We're moving to, to, to the phone as, as a universal proxy uh, electronic representative for you, making sure these phones are secure is critically important, browser security and, and, and security. I mean, cryptography lives in this ideal cloud world where, you know, Alice has a key and can keep it secret <laughs> and so on. And, and that's just not where we are yet with, with the platforms. We need to be able to uh, uh, instantiate that ideal framework of, of parties who can keep secrets and use them securely with, with hardware and software systems that, that really uh, make, make, satisfy those axioms. Uh, we're a long ways to do that, and it's, it's getting critical. So this morning we heard uh, uh, very enthusiastic talks about cloud computing. And once again, I have to uh, rain on the parade. I'm uh, deeply worried about it. And uh, you see, the, the big elephant in the room that no one is talking much about is uh, government intervention in all of this. Uh, you have to uh, remember that uh, the telephone system is uh, quite secure. It has lots of uh, technologies uh, built in, but then there is some fat pipe which is coming out of the back office of uh, AT&T uh, San Francisco uh, phone exchange going all the way to the NSA. So I think that uh, in, uh, once uh, most people will move their uh, uh, IT operations into the cloud, it is going to be the wet dream of governments. And uh, <laughs> I think you, you, just have to, you just have to remember uh, the story of Crypto AG. Uh, you remember a company which was selling a large fraction of their uh, uh, cryptographic devices to third world countries, and uh, it turned out to be a front uh, company for the NSA and its German equivalent. And uh, if uh, in the future we are going to uh, see uh, dozens and dozens of uh, companies offering cloud services, please don't use Cloud AG services. <laughs> Well, I'm not fond of the cloud either, frankly. You're renting an interface, and you only get the interface. You don't know what else is cuddling up to it and going into your pockets. So I do think you have to write your contracts very carefully, at least, on what's the service level agreements, otherwise you are at great risk. And that ties in also the, the, the last thing I wanted to talk about here. Cybercrime and other malicious attacks are occurring at an increasing rate, and they are more subtle across more technology sectors. Remember we had a credit derivative problem that caused a meltdown in the current recession because it was a complex instrument not fully understood that was trusted and widely used. I predict a trust bubble meltdown coming soon for our industry. And for exactly the same reasons, we have complex operations in place that are in very complex, tightly intertwined systems, and the processes are not well understood or analyzed, but they are widely used and trusted. That is a recipe for disaster, and it won't hold off long. The cure, as I've asked before, of vendors and other places, please start building more quality into the implementations. It can be done. I mentioned, not a, I didn't get a chance today, we skipped the question, but I really want the vendors to lean forward in the following sense. When you hear a vun there are two things going on out there in the malice world, vulnerabilities and zero days, the big deal. You know, oh my God, they got me. But the zero day is based on the vulnerability that may have been known about for a long time. One of the recent patch cycles Microsoft went through, and I'm not beating on Microsoft, this could happen to anybody. They're just the unfortunate example. There was a vulnerability that had been known for about 17 years, not yet patched. And it caused a brutal problem for them, uh, image-wise, in the patch cycle, because the patch caused blue screens of death on machines that were already infected, and therefore, how, how can you predict what's going to happen anyway? But 17 years and not yet addressed, give me a break. Lean forward. When you're developing a product, you can't go through all the processes we do at NSA. It's too damned expensive. We couldn't compete with you on the devices. But we do try to give robust implementations, and the more vulnerabilities you cover and your competitors don't, there is your competitive advantage. When the zero day emerges, you survive, they die. It can be to your commercial advantage, damn it. Put some money on the table, lean forward on the vulnerabilities, don't just let them sit there until you first smell the attack. End of message. Well, that brings us to the end of this year's Cryptographers panel. I'd like to thank the audience for joining us.